and welcome everybody to this um, panel of six excellent speakers from Asia talking about developing national space ecosystem in a global space community. Um, I'm your host for, for this panel. My name is Kasia Klatworthy and I'm head of customer training at SSDL. Just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, you might have seen that this web webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will use the recorded uh, recording uh, for promotional purposes to spread the awareness about the topic and it will be made uh, publicly available. Uh, if you have any questions during the panel, uh, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will try to address uh, the questions at the end of all panelists' uh, speeches. Uh, if we have no time to do that or we miss a few questions, we will come back to you by email uh, with the answer. So um, we will be hearing today from six panelists representing Asian perspective. Uh, we will have government, academia and industry representatives uh, sharing their experience about how to create a thriving and long lasting space ecosystem in their uh, countries, in, in their region with a global impact. Uh, I hope we can all learn and, and listen to some real life examples, uh, showcases and lessons learned from uh, those institutions and organizations um, taking part in, in the panel today. So uh, let's start and move to the first speaker, Lynette Tan from Singapore Space Technology Limited. Uh, Lynette is chief executive uh, of that organization, but more importantly, she identifies new opportunities and develops effective way for government, companies, industry to take part in emerging Asian space um, community. So I think her view will be spot on about um, on the topic of that uh, panel. And I'm looking forward to hearing her view on the Singapore case. Lynette, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take one minute to um, say a big sorry to the real SSTL because uh, for some uh, you know, requirements in Singapore, we had to change our name from the Singapore Space and Technology Association that you're all familiar with uh, to Singapore Space and Technology Limited. And I was trying to tell our friends from the real SSTL that, you know, Singapore, Surrey, Space, Satellite, they all start with the same few alphabets S, uh, but everybody knows that you guys are the original. And thank you for having this opportunity to share uh, from the other SSTL in the Asia Pacific, um, with whom we share a lot of heritage from the Surrey, because they were one of the earlier uh, contributors to our Malayan payload back in the 80s. So when I was you know, like running around um, in pants and diapers uh, at that time. So that was a, a lot of collaboration. It, I thought it was good to share from the Singapore perspective because Singapore doesn't yet have a space agency, uh, but you can see that there are, you know, prominent activities that we have done, uh, you know, with the national, the global space ecosystem. And I wanted to share just some examples of how a small country that hardly really requires the use of satellite because we are only 729 square kilometers um, large. Uh, but how, what are, how, how do we collaborate you know, to create our uh, ecosystem that is suitable for Singapore? Uh, so one of the many, broadly speaking, the range of activities we do uh, as a business federation uh, in Singapore is we try to have industry linkages and because there's a lot of, uh, you know, re it's very pragmatic to say what is the use case. So we conduct international challenges to let people know how the space industry fits into our everyday lives. Uh, we facilitate technology development because space also is one of the frontiers in pushing many technology developments from 3D printing to AI ML to systems engineering. Uh, and we also run accelerated programs for startups because of the strong privatization trend now in the space industry. We wanted to give a lift up to the accelerators uh, through the accelerator program to startups. And of course, we provide a relevant training program as our suite of activities. 
Uh, and through all these efforts, we feel they contribute positively to the development of a national ecosystem. We are fortunate that Singapore is a small country. Uh, so it, it helps to, you know, it's very fast for us to see if something works or not. Uh, and then you can see from some examples how we linked it to the global space ecosystem. Uh, also, it's okay. So also who sits on our advisory council, uh, since we are more or less a, you know, independent organization, but we do work with many government agencies, and we engage them in our development of roadmap, uh, strategies, uh, thinking, and we're very fortunate that they have, they're very open minded, and in accepting and spending, you know, time with us very generously to give us guidance. Uh, you can see that they are mostly Singaporeans because I feel uh, that you know it's they are all the very experienced uh, you know people in the government, so they would give very good advice on what would work in Singapore. Uh, as Singapore cannot have a cookie cutter approach in how many countries did it, so we needed to be very specific to the local landscape. Um, so this is the topic. And some of the things we've done is actually over the last 15 years, uh, in many countries, you have the space agency created and then they have business partners that they work with or business federations that they work with. It's kind of the reverse here in Singapore. Uh, the SSTL was created first and then uh, in 2013, about five years later, the Office for Space Technology and Industry was established under the Singapore Economic Development Board, which is under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, so it's again, you know, I felt that this was a bit of a unique factor in Singapore. Uh, and then it becomes very important that the government, the office and SSTL uh, and uh, academia, which plays a very, very important and prominent role in the Singapore space landscape, uh, learn to work together. And so creating opportunities for dialogue becomes uh, very important. You can also see in our roadmap that we talk a lot about JAXA, which is our very close uh, partner physically in this part of the world. Uh, you know, NASA is in a different time zone, ESA is in a different time zone. I know we're all on Zoom these days, but sometimes it's really useful to have morning meeting with someone who's also in the morning time frame, uh, you know, little perks that we enjoy. Uh, so you can see that in the milestone, we work very closely with JAXA in their various programs in hosting the Asia Pacific Space Agency Forum, uh, Regional Space Agency Forum twice, in collaborating on Asian tri G experiments, in using the JSOT uh, from the Kibo to, to launch our quantum, uh, you know, nano satellite into space. Uh, so that kind of international collaboration is very, very important, whether we are a business federation or whether we are a space uh, agency. And I think that really helps to keep Singapore and SSTL in alignment with the global space ecosystem. Uh, you will also be familiar that we run the Global Space and Technology Convention, which happens every February. Um, and it's a very strong commercial uh, platform for discussions. And this is where we then get engaged and involved with the international space community. Uh, so you see various platforms that we participate in or if required, we created to allow the Singapore national ecosystem to connect with the global uh, ecosystem. And of course, we participate in the International Astronautical Federation and also many conferences. Uh, so I'm also wearing this uh, JAXA jacket here which is for the Kibo uh, Robot Programming Challenge, which we participated earlier this year. Uh, and, uh, so we're expanding our type of collaboration with regional partners and giving Singaporeans and Singapore students opportunities to understand the global landscape. Oh, yeah, I, I did have, I do have a slide on this. We have uh, about, you know, 800, 900 delegates attending this year. I think it was one of the last sh space show that happened before the world got locked down. Um, so we met, we, we're very grateful. We met so many people there. And then I think there was Washington, uh, satellite in Washington, but a lot of other shows went cyber, uh, went online. So we were really grateful to be one of the few shows. Uh, I think we were one of the last space show that had a physical turnout. Uh, we don't know when that's ever going to come back but I appreciated seeing so many of you there. Um, but again, this is 
uh, you know, with 800 old people and they're not, Singapore doesn't have a super big space industry. So you can see how that, you know, having a international presence in the convention was very important in helping us to get a pulse of the local landscape or the global landscape and what are the key trends that's ongoing. Uh, this is an accelerated program we run, and this is a good case study because it is done in partnership with Enterprise Singapore. Uh, like I said, you know, we have an office for space uh, technology and industry, but uh, there are also different agencies who look at different things to promote Singapore and to develop Singapore. Um, and the beauty of not having a space agency yet, of course, we all want that to happen, is that we could then pick up specific partners to work with that is in alignment with their agenda. So besides the Enterprise Singapore, uh, which also works closely with the space office, uh, there is another Infocom's Media and Development Authority that SSTL works with, but that's another example, which I don't think I have time to share. But let's look at, talk about this accelerator program. Uh, again, try to understand the Singapore ecosystem. There are many accelerators in the world and they offer co-locked working spaces and they have like in-house mentors. But remember, Singapore is like a very compressed Tokyo city. Uh, so real estate prices is very expensive and mentors are actually very accessible because we're not a big country. And therefore the accelerator program doesn't have like in-house mentor, in-residence mentor. Uh, it doesn't have like co-working space. Uh, in fact, we try to only focus on quality interaction between the startup and the advisors. Uh, so for the advisors, we have local advisors and we make it a point for our startups to be successful, to also have access to international advisors. And therefore, we have advisors from Luxembourg, from Europe, uh, you know, from Germany. We have uh, advisors from UAE. We have advisors from Japan. We have advisors from Singapore. We have advisors from Indonesia. So we have advisors internationally joining the program and we have international startups joining the program. Um, and what has happened is many of these startups have been hiring uh, local students. So local students, meaning students based in Singapore, but they might not necessarily be local because Singapore is very cosmopolitan. So I thought the accelerator program was a very good addition to the national space ecosystem because now we have a space accelerator program, but it's also very international. And I feel that our startups uh, benefit from, you know, knowing what's knowing and having connections to the global landscape. Um, and again, that is very core in SSTL's uh, mission in Singapore to grow the ecosystem. Uh, we also partner with Singapore uh, organizations, one of them being Ascenders. Ascenders is part of Capital Land Group, which is Asia, one of Asia Pacific uh, largest private real estate uh, conglomerate. So, we want to, again, you, you know, wherever you are developing your national ecosystem, you should ideally work with local partners and to see the benefit. And the reason for this partnership is because we want the real estate company to be a potential end user for remote sensing, earth observation, you know, detect, uh, building detection, fault detection, uh, and communications uh, development. And because Ascendus Innovation is a very frontier, a very forward looking type of uh, real estate company, they try to offer their tenants access to new technology as a value added service. So we were very, uh, you know, glad to find this kind of synergy from someone from the who, you know, who's handling real estate. It's completely different outside of the ecosystem. Uh, but I think we benefited because Singapore is a very small country and, uh, you know, it, they, they do spend time to get to know one another. You can find areas where you can collaborate with. And I think wherever, whichever country you're in, uh, it's important to have this kind of strategic partnership with large local conglomerates. Uh, another partnership with Heaven, this should be my last case study and example, is working with Flex, previously known as Flextronics, which is the largest or the second largest electronic manufacturing services. Now, we know that there's a proliferation of the small set industry because of the uh, advance in technologies in the electronic sector. So, 
you know, there's no reason why uh, electronics manufacturing companies cannot play a role in it. And in fact, uh, we are very grateful that the regional or global headquarter for Flex is located in Singapore. And so we collaborated with them to give our companies access to manufacturing facilities in Singapore. Uh, so if you want to own a plant in Singapore, it's very, very expensive because like I said, we're kind of like Tokyo. Uh, so if there is a very big MNC that already has such facilities, you know, so SSTL brokered that partnership with Flex to say, could you open up some of your capacity so that our satellite companies can work with you uh, to scale up and to produce uh, the, the components, the modules, or even the full system. Uh, and actually SSTL provided the training to Flex you know, to get the engineers to understand uh, what is satellite manufacturing and what is satellite engineering. And when they split everything up, they realized they were all PCB bots. And so it was something, it was a language uh, in more ways than one that was, that they felt comfortable with. Uh, and again, this is that kind of ecosystem development that we have. In the previous slide, I spoke about you know, working with a Singapore conglomerate, uh, Singapore large company. And now I'm talking to an international company that's headquartered in Singapore and how we leveraged on that to make sure that we have a good, vibrant, uh, thriving ecosystem. And I think this program has been doing very well because in Singapore during the COVID period, Flex is an essential service provider. And therefore our startups or companies working with Flex could continue to keep production going. Uh, so that has been very, very beneficial. Uh, in our work and to the ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another small example. I don't know if I have much time, Casey. Um, no, so if you let me wrap up, that would be appreciated. Yes. Uh, so just one more minute. Yes, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, good. So, you know, so Victoria uh, is based in Uruguay and uh, there's no cows in Singapore. Okay, there are less than 100 cows, maybe there are less than 10. You know, but but her, her job, her, her product is to do cattle, um, you know, cattle tracking. And because of the partnership, because she's a, she incorporated a company in Singapore just last year. Uh, and again, because of the small size of Singapore is, you know, and there's this design uh, ecosystem and then there's a manufacturing ecosystem and there's a supply chain ecosystem and we are quite well connected. So she actually located and opened an office in Singapore last year. Uh, and there's no, there's no market in Singapore for her. Uh, but again, because of the business infrastructure, she found that at the beginning stage of her, her, her company, you know, it was valuable to be located here. And I think many startups also located themselves in Singapore. Um, AstroScale was one of them and Gilmore as well. But when they scaled up and they start to get funds and sources from other countries, you know, there is a need to be where your funds are or where your customers are. Uh, but in, in the in beginning stage, you know, I think SSTL in Singapore, we have a nice way to incubate and help to grow the startups. So, okay. Thank you very much. I hope I give you a good, you know, breadth of examples of uh, what we do here to promote the ecosystem and to tie it with the global space landscape. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for a very informative um, showcase of what Singapore is doing and particularly impressive, I think, uh, to learn how you collaborate with different agencies within the Singapore. So you're not very disattached from, from the other sectors of the economy. And as well, um, how much influence and advice you are getting from abroad as well. So it's a true, true partnership, I think, from your local case to the global community. So it was presented perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, and moving on to the next speaker, who is uh, Ray Kawashima. Uh, Ray is Secretary General of UNICEF Global, and she has contributed significantly to micro, nano, and pico satellites for education and business applications through her leadership role in the UNICEF. UNICEF is the University Space Engineering Consortium. So I hope we are going to get here uh, an angle from the academia and how you know UNICEF is a global organization with a footprint in Asia and how uh, education and academia plays role in the local uh, ecosystem. Ray, uh, the floor is yours. If you could unmute yourself and show the video. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I will talk about how to make a national regional ecosystem in a global space community from human resources viewpoint. First of all, I'd like to introduce UNICEF Global. 
UNICEF stands for University Space Engineering Consortium. And we established it in 2002 in Japan to promote practical space projects such as nanosatellites and hybrid rockets at the university level. And UNICEF Global was established in 2013 as an international nonprofit, non governmental organization. It consists of local chapters across the world. In 2017, we were accepted as permanent observer by the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. space. And our primary objective is to help create a world where space science and technology used by individuals and institutions in every country which are poor for peaceful purposes and for the benefit of humankind. At this moment, we have 21 local chapters, 54 points of contact, and the number of university members is 171. We have just started corporate membership and we have three corporate members now. Let me talk about Vision 2030 all. This is our big dream, which is by the end of 2030, let's create a world where university students can participate in practical space projects in all countries and regions. Actually, it was changed from the original one, Vision 2020-100, because uh, we joined UN family and the United Nations, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, key principle is no one will be left behind. That's why we decided to change from 100 countries to all countries and regions. But actually, in every country, there must exist some space-related experts. As they need to understand what to purchase, at least. Here is ecosystem model of university space activities. Let me explain. You put small investment and resources to the university. And the university professor do what they can do then good education at the university is possible. Because there are many good excellent education tools in space engineering field. CANSAT, HEPTASAT, uh, the CubeSat, and hybrid rockets. And there are many good training program already. So as a result, the well-educated and motivated students are produced then these people will become driving forces in the space field in your country. They will do new space business, space projects, and the government, uh, the awareness is increased. Then more investment and resources will be coming to university. So <clears throat> positive spiral can be observed. Ecosystem, it's possible. In Japan, we are enjoying this positive spiral uh, quite a few years, but this is for space faring countries case. So what will happen in non space faring nations? It's same, spawn of investment, good education and good people. However, what will happen in the non space faring nations? No position, no funding, so no interest in home country. Then these people get job in other countries or other fields. So the first investment is to contribute to providing the human resources to other fields and other nations, which is good. However, no positive spiral can be seen. No ecosystem here. What can we do to change this situation? Good education and the good people. Then if there is position, job, fund, support, interest in the home country, then these people can survive in the space field in the home country. Then new space business, new space projects, they can do that. And the government 
eventually will be aware that this activity, space activity is really important for the company, a country, I'm sorry. So attraction more resources and support and the positive spiral can be seen. And this positive spiral will strengthen the space activities. Here is ecosystem in the non-spacefaring nations. So the point is here. How can we change the situation? How to make position, job, fund, support, interest in the home country? Just think about it. Yeah, I listed several, but I my brain is too, too, too tiny. So I'm open to listening to your suggestions and opinions or better, much better ideas. The easiest way is to take a position of regional national representative of global space communities. You said global has some uh, positions, point of contact and the mission idea uh, contest regional coordinators. And I, I believe Space Week or SGAC, this organization will also have such, such a positions available. And the second one is organize or join space education program or projects. There are many uh, training or projects. Help to start training, cancel competition, nano satellite mission idea contest, keep that project. So you just uh, pick up um, one or two or three and organize uh, for your country. And the another idea is education to younger generation and non-scientists engineers. I think this is blue ocean now. And the third idea is launch a space related company in your nation, in your country or region. Small companies fine and if it is sustainable. So we need to be wise. The fourth idea is organize or join space job fair. In Japan, the second space job fair will take place on December 5th and 6th. Uh, we started this one uh, last, from last year and it is quite, quite good. And that's why we decided to uh, the, uh, organize it this year too. Of course, this year we cannot do the real one. So we need to do it online. So the next one is the, uh, it's, it, this, is, this one is very important. Engage with relevant government and non-governmental entities in the country to explore if there are possibilities to work together towards developing capacity in the country that is conductive to creating an environment that will bring about suitable opportunities, including jobs, and favorable conditions for support, funding, and space business. And government entities uh, could be uh, the, some ministries or national research institutions, depending on the country. Um, and non-government entities could be ex existing NGOs and companies that may be interested in using global activities. Let me conclude. Energizing universities will make a difference for national, regional space activities because almost all countries have universities. So providing effective training tools and methods to existing universities, this is important, existing universities will help produce human resources in space field. Human resource is key to make something good happen in your country. And with good education, well-trained and highly motivated students will become driving forces for national, regional space activities if there are suitable positions for them in the home country. And it is important to make a national, regional strategy for human resource development to sustain national, regional space activities. So thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Ray. That was very informative again. Uh, I think particularly interesting point that, you know, even with uh, good education, 
uh, you cannot guarantee that the people will uh, contribute to the growth of the industry because they may be looking for opportunities outside of your country. So I think it's particularly important that you know there is the next project for the, the people that you educate to keep them interested, keep them occupied, and keep them contributing to the you know your economy and not just um, going abroad uh, and finding new jobs, better positions elsewhere. So I think it's a very very valid point how education you know needs to work together with the government, with the project, with the uh, industry to make this uh, loop that you presented the spiral a positive spiral rather than you know just provide good education but you still don't have the benefit because people are going away so a very good presentation thank you very much um, on that point I wanted to share with you uh, a question uh, and engage a little bit the audience uh, the question is more relevant to maybe the first speaker. We, we haven't mentioned that. Um, but you think of the biggest issues that uh, space industry may face. And we have uh, four questions, uh, whether it is, you know, space debris, whether it is regulations, lack of launch capacity, or too many promises. Uh, and I would like um, that the audience actually um, answer the question and let's see what is the general view on the topic of what is stopping the space industry from developing. Uh, I will share it in a few seconds, <clears throat> how many people have voted. So you should see on your screen uh, a poll where you sign up the question. I think panelists cannot vote at the moment. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So half of the people have responded so far. Okay, we are closing the vote. And you should see the results. So 35% is thinking that the lack of launch capacity and its cost is the major stopping point for space industry. And then quite a few of them as well think about regulation. So it's hard to say if it's uh, surprising. Um, depends, I presume, on the industry we are in and the business case. But uh, it's definitely one of the areas that that is still stopping the business cases to flourish. Um, I have one more question for you. It's related to what Ray was talking about, and this was, uh, you know, what is the best suitability of a CubeSat project? Uh, is it the space education? Is it a serious building block for business and services? Uh, CubeSats have some limited value or they are useful for R&D and uh, test beds. And let's launch the poll. Um, sorry, that's not the question. Okay, now you see the question about the suitability of CubeSat projects. What's of the most value you think? So let's quickly click through the answers and see what our audience is thinking about that topic. <clears throat> okay, so more than... Uh, 60% of people have voted, so I'm ending the polling. And interestingly, both space education and business um, area, CubeSat for business and services, have the same amount of votes, each um, 34%. So more than 70% um, you know, of people think CubeSats are good for education and business, which is, uh, which is great. Okay, so... Thanks for participating in that. I thought it would be a good way to engage with you and get your opinions on, on some of the topics. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Chris Blackberry. Uh, he's a group chief operating officer of Astroscale. Um, he oversees the operation and expansion of the growing international company. 
Um, we heard from Lynette, you know, AstroScale was present, is present in Singapore, but the headquarters are in Japan. So truly um, Asian uh, footprint with offices as well in UK, US and Israel. So an international growing company, rapidly growing. So it would be very valuable, I think, to get, Chris, to get Chris's opinion on, you know, what help the, the industry, the company to grow uh, and what are the, the stopping points and, and what he thinks about, you know, the ecosystem supporting um, their activities. Chris? If you hey, Cassia, thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks a lot. I, I first of all want to say I'm disappointed in those polling results I just saw. Space debris, only 2% say it's the worst problem. So um, I, I recognize the other ones are big issues as well, but clearly I have a bias on this topic. Um, so uh, I would give you the whole presentation about why space debris is such an important topic to focus on, but maybe that's for a different conversation. Uh, today I'll just be talking a bit about AstroScale as a company. Um, and I'll, I'll just give a few kind of uh, ideas about what uh, it took for us to succeed up to this point uh, and um, how we're planning to go forward. Uh, and I'm gonna obviously be giving this from the perspective of a startup, of a startup company. So uh, maybe a bit different than the previous two speakers. So let me uh, share my screen. And assuming everyone uh, can see this. I hope yes, we can see that. Excellent, thank you. So, um, so from a startup perspective, let me um, let me go through what I think are the important topics to be aware of. Uh, as Cassia mentioned, I'm the I'm the COO. So I joined the company about three and a half years ago. Uh, AstroScale uh, was founded in 2013, so about seven and a half years old now. And, and I was previously with NASA. Uh, the space agency here in Japan as the uh, attache at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, so took, came over here as COO and I cover uh, global growth of the company and, uh, and a lot of uh, aspects of internal uh, management as well as external uh, strategic planning. So uh, AstroScale itself, Cassia and uh, Lynette both mentioned we were founded in Singapore back in 2013. Um, we uh, then opened up an office in Japan in 2015. Uh, in 2017, we opened up an office in Harwell in the UK, in 2019 in Denver in the US. And then just earlier this year, we purchased the assets of Effective Space Solutions, an Israeli company. And so this uh, full uh, scope of what we do, we focus on uh, space debris uh, removal uh, mitigation, in low Earth orbit uh, and satellite life extension in the geo orbit. So right now uh, we have about 150 people in our five global offices. Uh, so we've grown a lot, I think in the three and a half years. When I started, I was one of the only non-Japanese people on the team and there were maybe 30 people total. So now we have 150 and it's about half Japanese. So I'd say about 70 to 75 uh, Japanese, the rest uh, international. Uh, we just finished our uh, Series E fundraise and have now raised close to $200 million. Uh, and our first launch, we just announced a test of uh, debris capture capability is going to be um, in um, March of next year uh, on a Soyuz. And uh, we are to, to make the shout out to SSTL. Uh, SSTL is a big contributor as they built uh, one aspect of our, our satellite mission where we're going to be uh, capturing uh, a, a piece of uh, dummy debris uh, to demonstrate our capability. So uh, thank you to SSTL uh, as one of our uh, one of our partners on this. Um, so developing a space ecosystem. Let me talk first uh, just about a few ideas uh, domestically, uh, and then talk about internationally because we are a Japanese company right now, is where our headquarters are with a global footprint, as I just showed you. So just going to run through some ideas here as to uh, what I think is uh, leads to success. So first, uh, government cooperation. Um, close ties are essential, as has been discussed already, um, you know, from the UN perspective with Ray and Lynette talking about what they do in Singapore. Government ministries need to be supportive of commercial startups, and there needs to be a mutually beneficial environment. This is a relationship that, that has to be uh, sustainable and grow together. Uh, and each has to recognize the value of the other. And it's, it's important because sometimes you see that there's this 
uh, new space, old space dichotomy. And, and you, we can't have that if we're going to be successful. Investors. All of that money that we have there, that $191 million is from investors. So it's from people who believed in our vision uh, and contributed toward that, uh, that future business case. So you got to find broad thinking, long-term investors, understand the risks and rewards of the space ecosystem. Can't be a uh, near-term return. It's, it's not going to happen in space. So you got to be in it for a bit more of a long haul but it's developing, the market's maturing. And so investors, those investors that invested in us, they're not doing it as a giveaway. They're not doing it as a handout. They expect to see a financial return at some point as all investors do. So obviously they're gonna to wanna to see a business case, but they have to be a bit more um, long-term thinking and, and looking at the bigger picture uh, of the mission. Industry, competition, competitors. Uh, we use these terms or see these terms around. In most cases, our industry is just too nascent and the market is not always clear to try to go it alone all the time and ignore uh, cooperating with other partners uh, or try to be vicious uh, in terms of developing the business. Really need to think about uh, this space community is small. Uh, you're gonna bump into people again and again as you, as you shift jobs and, and companies and areas. So work closely with um, different partners. Academic community, uh, it's so essential. Develop that talent pipeline. Uh, find opportunities for shared research. Uh, partnering with the academic community is something that SSTL obviously does really well. Uh, and so finding that community, developing that pipeline, and that's something that is, is really important. And we're still trying to work on that um, in Japan. Uh, but we do have partnerships around, around the country and we're continuing to try to develop them. And, and they've been very, very helpful in all areas. I should stop and say our partnerships with everyone, the government, JAXA, the ministries here, that's what's sustained us really. Uh, media, marketing, communication, it drives interest among the general public, investors, government. Um, a lot of engineers don't necessarily see the, the media or the marketing communications as the biggest uh, important aspect. They wanna build stuff, but really it's the marketing and communications that it's like, a, it's like a, a virtuous cycle. It drives things. You get people excited about it. It brings on investors. It brings money. That brings in engineers, which brings in development, which gets more interest in the media. And it gets this great cycle going. So it's something that, that has to be prioritized. And then I mentioned this earlier, but established space and emerging space. I don't even like to use the old and new space because that just that almost signifies the old is going away and dying soon and the new is coming up, and that's not happening. I mean, NASA, JAXA, ESA, they're not going away anytime soon, and they shouldn't. We need government funding of this to, to, to drive the industry. And so uh, an example of this is uh, actually a few years ago when I was with NASA, the administrator, uh, Bolden, came over, uh, and I had him, I was the attache at the time, and I introduced uh, Axel Space and iSpace and Astroscale uh, to the administrator to talk about what's happening in Japan. And that was a communication between NASA and New, New Space in Japan. Uh, next slide. So an international presence is, is essential. So I talked about the domestic, what it's going to take. Internationally, what's it going to take? The space business is small. Commercial market for services is still difficult to identify. Doing everything in one country is really tough. So many of these aspects of this ecosystem are global from the supply chain, talent acquisition, tech advancements, customers, regulatory environment, goes on and on. You have to have a global footprint. So what does it take to make sure the global footprint works An inspiring mission? Most of us in the space community already have this, but the battle for talent is global and you need to be inspiring and you need to bring this inspiration to the talent that's gonna come and make your company work. And you can't depend on one small market. Lynette mentioned the fact that the Singapore market is pretty small. It is the case in Japan as well, especially when it's compared to US or Europe. Communication and transparency. You have to make sure that there's discussions among the team internally and externally. Misunderstandings happen, especially across borders and languages. So frequent communication is so essential uh, for, for how, uh, how the teams work together. International partnerships. Uh, innovation is everywhere and supply chains are global. So uh, you need to find those partnerships everywhere. I mentioned our great partnership with SSTL. I worked really closely with Alex, who's on the line, uh, and I think we'll talk later, to develop an international partnerships. That's, that's essential. 
Uh, policy that was brought up in the in the uh, poll question earlier. Licensing and regulations require global input and global influence, and that's why we've developed uh, outposts in DC, uh, outside of London in Harwell, here in Tokyo. Uh, we are trying to make sure we stay closely connected to the policymakers who are really going to shape so much of what happens in the space ecosystem. Internal organization, one of the toughest things as a startup and as we're trying to develop is to develop these clear processes and procedures that can make a sustainable company, but also maintain this vibrant startup culture. And that's one of these huge challenges that we work with internally. And so it's, uh, it's an international issue as we grow larger and larger to try to maintain this exciting startup culture while also becoming more of a real company, you know, where we can have processes. And I'll, I'll just close on a, on a GIF that I show when people ask me what I'm doing as a startup, uh, as we try to grow this company and scale what we're doing. This is sometimes what I feel like is happening. The train is running fast down the tracks and we're trying to put the tracks down so the train doesn't fly off it. And that's kind of what we're doing. And it's exciting and it's fun. Uh, and that's why this industry is so exciting and fun. But uh, Lots of challenges, but lots of fun things happening. And it's important to maintain all of these uh, cooperative uh, activities. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Chris, uh, for a very good presentation. And, and at the end, closing it with um, a, a fun remark. Um, and I do agree, you know, the, the space debris is an issue that is widely, you know, um, missed or, or not put at the forefront of our minds and uh, I think to maybe um, uh, kind of not repair but you know help the situation after the, the first poll that nobody said about space debris I have another poll for you which I think will um, help a little bit um, and it's about one person's small satellite is another person's debris how will the space debris issue ultimately be solved? So we have the answers on governments will solve it in time, for example, by international agreement or taxing each spacecraft, uh, or, sorry, manufacturers uh, will all play their part despite the extra cost and universities will also develop better methods. C, nothing will change until there is a major incident or D, commercial companies will provide the service. Uh, so let's launch the, the poll. Uh, let's see what the audience thinks about the topic of the space debris. <clears throat> and I'll share, share the results uh, in a second. So we have 30% of people voted so far. It's quite a lot of changes going on. I can see that on the screen. Okay, so let's end the polling. We have 60% of people voting. And you should see the results on screen. Uh, and I think maybe I'll give Chris a, a, a right to comment on this. So majority, well, not the, the biggest answer was nothing will change until there is a major incident. Yeah, I mean, I understand. I understand the point. That's 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 the the mindset. Obviously, I think D is the right answer. Clearly, um, <laughs> but uh, but it's actually going to be a combination of things. I mean, governments have to play a role. That's why we're focused on both. But um, we're trying to change that perception that that it's going to take a major incident. Our our message is uh, the 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 prevention is better than the cure. If we wait until there's a major incident, the cleanup is gonna cost that much more, it's gonna be that much harder and we're all gonna suffer for it. So uh, it's one of one of my jobs to convince people to make that change before that happens. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kai. Let's uh, move on to the next speaker and we will invite Mr. Uh, Dr. Bayundi Hasabi, uh, who is coordinator of the dissemination division and a senior researcher from Satellite Technology Center of La Pan. So we will be looking at the Indonesian ecosystem. And he was awarded a national award for outstanding dedication in satellite design and development and became a role model in the satellite technology development to the country. 
So very impressive. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to his view on Indonesian ecosystem. Um, I'm aware we are kind of getting closer to the end of the session. So I would appreciate if we could keep it, you know, uh, short and sweet. So then all the speakers have the chance to, to speak to the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate Kesia, for this great opportunity. I hope uh, you can see my screen now. So I will try to make it uh, uh, less than 10 minutes. So yeah, so as uh, an in introduction from Kesia, so uh, actually I came from Satellite Technology Center from Lapan, uh, Indonesia. We are an uh, Indonesian space agency. So um, as you may or some of you aware that we are starting the uh, uh, to get the space technology through the uh, small and micro satellite program. And then um, we are starting also uh, the, the strategy that we, uh, we are looking for at the beginning is, uh, of course, we, we start to develop uh, Indonesian capability at, at, at first. Because we realized that the uh, during um, at, at the beginning we don't have enough resources, even the facility and so on. Even though we know that Indonesia is the second country in the world uh, using the satellite technology since 1976 for domestic satellite satellite communication, uh, but then uh, we have to focus uh, to get also this uh, kind of space technology. And then uh, because of that, we started in uh, 2003. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we start with the development of the capability and we focus on the knowledge, skill, and, and experience. And also uh, to have some knowledge in integration tests and launch the and operation of, of the satellite. And of course, uh, because we are at, uh, at the at the time is a uh, um, developing country, of course, uh, the cost also will become a major issue beside the uh, human resources. Then, of course, the uh, idea is we have to make a design to cost satellite strategy. And then we started with the LAPAN A1 or LAPAN Tubsat co under cooperation with the uh, Technical uh, University in Berlin, in Germany. And then um, uh, after this successful launch of LAPAN A1 or LAPAN Tubsat, and then we realized that we have to um, we have to increase the, uh, the capability of our satellite technology into the uh, to extend the performance of of the satellite, and then we uh, we we develop the second phase of uh, our satellite development, and we start to develop Lapan A2 and Lapan A3, and then now we move further for the uh, other project for. Uh, which focus on space applications and we divide it into known and proven missions and uh, we also divide it into the dedicated and new missions and we expect that this phase three will be uh, our lapan f4 that will be launched by uh, last quarter of 2021 uh, next year and beside that uh, this uh, technological cap capability we of course need to have the legal basis so Based on this uh, experience, we think that it's very important to have the legal basis so that we have a space law in 2013. And also we have the presidential regulation for the uh, national space roadmap. So these two legal basis is very important for a country if we want to continue the uh, uh, technology development in, in the country. And we also see that the another way to to uh, engage the uh, the national capability is to to give the best um, uh, uh, knowledge and also how we can show that the satellite utilization is very important to our country and then um, if you can see this slide, there are a lot of things that we are doing with this two only by having only two satellites. So we have Lapan A2 and Lapan A3 here, and we try to educate more than 10,000 people how they can use the satellite during the emergency. And this satellite uh, has been used also during the emergency situations, during the earthquake, and also some uh, heavy flooding in 2020 in some areas in Indonesia. 
And beside that, uh, another mission that we also show to the people is how this satellite can also uh, use for maritime surveillance so that we can monitor all the uh, ships around the world, including especially in Indonesia. And because this two satellite is multi-mission satellite, we also show to the people that the, uh, the Earth observation with Lapan A2 and Lapan A3 satellite also very useful to have a land cover uh, imaging of Indonesia. And you can see here to, to, to the left, uh, so we can map the Indonesia by using uh, the satellite. And another thing that are very important that during a disaster, of course, the satellite technology is very, will be very useful. And then um, we try to get an, uh, as much as the, the image during a disaster, like here. So during an um, uh, earthquake happens in uh, Rinjani Mountain in um, in an island in, in Indonesia. And also there is a liquefaction in 2018, uh, as you may aware, in Palu. And then also the last uh, Krakatau eruption in 2020 also is, has been monitored by the satellite. And very recently, now we are um, uh, have an alert of the Merapi activity. So we deploy our satellite to monitor the uh, the activity of the mountain as well. So you can see here that lot of activities that that we are using to utilize the the satellite uh, application. And during the COVID, of course, uh, because now it's uh, very. Uh, very heavy pandemics. So we also teach the people uh, that about the socialization of uh, um, as stay at home and fight COVID-19 through the messaging by sending a message through, through, through the satellite and the satellite will spread the message all over the equator, especially because uh, this uh, messaging uh, spreading is used uh, 1182, which fly over the equatorial uh, region so that all the message um, will be reached, will be heard by all the people uh, which have the um, capability to capability to receive this this message. And you can see here we we also have make uh, as also Chris mentioned the media. So we make a lot of media publication about the uh, utilization of of the satellite, and then uh, a lot of uh, media media publications and this is very important to engage the people how the importance of of the satellite system is and then as i mentioned before now we are we are getting close to uh, to to uh, my my end of my slide so actually we know that uh, in the indonesia is very prone to the uh, uh, natural disaster and then we have an idea to develop a satellite constellation for disaster early warning system and including the Internet of Things and data collect, uh, collecting platform. And uh, the idea is we want to have the nine satellite in equatorial plane because uh, equatorial plane is very important for Indonesia. And um, we can try to collect all the uh, disaster early warning uh, sensor, starting from the magnetometer, the automatic weather stations, uh, tsunami early warning, and so on. And Actually, the idea uh, is based uh, on the uh, last experience in Palu earthquake. Uh, we have a lot of uh, sensor, including the tsunami sensor. But as you know, because of this um, uh, earthquake happened, so all the terrestrial communication is collapsed. And of course, uh, nothing you can do except you have a satellite. So uh, this uh, come up, uh, make us come up the idea that we need to have uh, constellation of, of the satellite. And this satellite also will be used uh, not only for disaster early warning system, but of course now you, we know that uh, IoT is getting increased, uh, Internet of Things, and we will continue also for, uh, to build this platform to get all this uh, uh, maritime surveillance and also for uh, air navigation like ADSB, for example. And the collaboration of developing the satellite will be in, in uh, will be uh, in, include with um, will be joined together with many agencies in Indonesia. You can see here so many logos, 
uh, starting with the our Ministry of Research and Technology, and then uh, uh, Meteorological Department, and then uh, uh, and also the Transportation Department and local uh, a big company, the telecom company, and also local manufacturers. So we we hope that we can uh, we can by having this national program as this one, we can uh, uh, co um, combine all the nationals uh, capability to have this success project. And in this my last, uh, last slide, I also would like to, to share with you that as, as we know that uh, space technology is very expensive and we know that uh, in the country that there is, uh, if there is no uh, startup or there is no uh, uh, manufacturing industry for space, of course, it's very risky for them to entering the manufacturing uh, um, uh, uh, company. So what we are doing is, as a space agency, we are providing all the uh, all the facility uh, here, as as you can see, uh, starting with the uh, um, hundred thousand class clean room and collimators and uh, thermal vacuum chamber and all the uh, all the facility, including. All the uh, uh, biggest uh, SNX band full motion antenna system, biggest anechoic chamber for RF and PES in, in in Indonesia, and including we have the ground station as well. So we we hope that with this by providing all the facility, we and also uh, with standardized uh, test and research facility, we hope that we can support the development of satellite industry and startup in, in, in Indonesia so that uh, they can come up with the, the idea and then they can use this all the uh, very expensive facility and they can start to do their business. So we hope that by having these uh, ideas, we, we can create a, a startup industry in Indonesia. And I can inform you that now we have not really much, but uh, about uh, three startups now starting their uh, their um, ideas to make some um, projects and we hope that they will be success in near future. So thank you so much, uh, Keisha, for this uh, nice opportunity and also thank you for SSTL for in inviting me for this, for this uh, topic. Thank you, Dr. Hasby. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to see that each panelist really gave a different angle to the topic. So we saw in Indonesia, the, the ecosystem is largely based around data utilization and all the kind of awareness spreading, capacity building in data utility is kind of the key, key driving driver force uh, in Indonesia for development of space industry. So, so they are finding the need for data, which then uh, triggers the, the need for um, access to space. So thank you very much. Um, we are running a little bit out of time. Um, so I'll ask, Alex uh, Da Silva from SSTL, just to maybe um, summarize or, or share some a few points uh, in a short way. Um, Alex is really an expert in small satellite missions and have been involved in uh, satellite revolution from 1989. So quite a long time Alex is on the market uh, and experience with working with over 60 different missions and quite a lot of them were in Asia. So maybe a few points from Alex. Um, as well, we did have a question, or we have a question about how to start a capacity capacity building uh, program or project in, in the developing country. Uh, maybe you can combine that uh, with the answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kasia. And uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'll try and uh, wrap up essentially what the other speakers have said, given that we are running uh, a little bit over time. Um, what uh, I'll show here is pretty much what uh, everyone before me has been uh, saying. So if we look at growing a space economy, I think what we're hearing from the various speakers is that it is necessary to have, have all aspects of a space economy, including industry, academia and government. Generally, government is the one with needs. Uh, and, and we heard that from uh, Wayudi uh, from La Pan. Uh, is that there are, for instance, needs for disaster monitoring, for communications uh, and various national issues that can be solved by space. Uh, generally, uh, you want that uh, where you can to be solved uh, and supported by industry uh, and industry provides the taxes back to government to cover those type of things. So, so that that is self-fulfilling. Um, 
And as we heard from, from Lynette and Chris, the, the industry often uh, focus very much on particular applications, particular needs, particular requirements. Uh, and those can be exported so they can create value in the international space sector. Um, and so investments from government uh, into capability and requirements can often lead to industry being able to provide a service to that government, but also provide services outside the country. Um, but of course, there is a limited uh, number of requirements around the world for space. And really what everyone is looking at in the space sector is how do you grow that? Uh, and we heard that particularly from uh, Rei Kawashima, uh, is that if you have academia, that first of all provides the workforce, uh, but also it allows you to innovate and it allows you to essentially develop new capabilities that are not available anywhere else and allows you to differentiate. So government typically tends to fund academia to do this type of innovative work. And that then leads to capabilities that ind industry can implement. And that ultimately, that combination of academia, industry and government is necessary to have a successful space sector in any particular country. But the key question and the question that came up is how do you get to that point? Because if, if you have none of this, you probably just have the government needs and you don't necessarily have industry and you don't necessarily have the workforce or the uh, developments, how do you get there? Well, I think one way to look at that is uh, how have countries done this? This is a really complex chart and I, I don't have a lot of time to talk through this, but looking at the on the horizontal axis from 1990 to uh, 2019, this is the number of satellites launched and on the vertical bar uh, are countries. Uh, and as you can see on the chart, there's, there's pretty much a linear increase of number of countries getting involved in space. And I have a number of missions in Asia, particularly that are shown on the left-hand side, but the red dots show satellites and they are the first satellite for that nation that have been developed through collaboration. So what this shows is that most nations start their space program in some form of collaboration, whether that is an academic collaboration or a government buying a capacity uh, from uh, uh, an organization internationally to acquire that capability. Um, that is a very important lesson. And I think that that is what we're seeing. There's several lessons that come out and SSTL, my company, have been involved in many of these type of projects. The lessons that come out from this, and I think they have been reinforced by our speakers as well, is you need to focus on real applications. So just doing a project for project sake is, is not good enough. You need to have a purpose. And we see that in, in, in industry and we see that in uh, in government. Often they have very specific needs. and. Uh, so it is not about one satellite project, it's about the program. Uh, and that's shown in these lines is that there are, there are countries that are after they launch their first satellites, they repeatedly continue launching and using satellites. Uh, and either that is development or it is building capacity, building capability. So it's, it's not a project, it's a program. Um, and it's this focus on applications that uh, is very important in that and understanding what, what you are bringing to this. Um, I think that sort of wraps me up and I'll, I'll hand back to Kasia there. Thank you very much for, for the summary and uh, all the panelists for excellent presentation and I think portraying uh, really different, different angles uh, to that topic. Uh, I don't really want to keep you any longer. I know we run out of time, so we will answer the questions that we received uh, by email. So we will address them to uh, relevant panelists to, to come back to you. Uh, and I really thank all the participants to stick to us for an hour uh, and to listen to, to, to the excellent points from, from all the panelists uh, you know, from Asian region. So we hope to arrange something similar in the future. Uh, and uh, please watch that space, um, what we'll be doing. Thank you very much, and we can now disconnect and close that panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. Thank, Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Lena.